opportunity to influence your children. How hard it must have been for her to be the only one imparting these messages into her son. How hard it must have been for her to have maybe even a naysayer on the other side. Someone who maybe didn't believe or didn't agree with what she was teaching him. But in her endurance, she pressed forward. In order to be a good example to our children, we have to show a very sincere faith, an everyday kind of faith, a transparent faith. Submitting to God, being thankful, having joy even in your suffering, because joy doesn't mean happiness. Joy comes from the Lord. Happiness is a feeling based on external circumstances. Joy is joy that God gives you. And you have to be in the word. You cannot impart what you don't possess. You cannot teach your children and show them the word of God if you don't know it. They need to see you in the word. They need to hear the word coming from your lips. But more than that, they need to see you live the word. Paul reminds Timothy later on in this book, Chapter 3, verses 14 to 17, he says, Stick with what you learned and believed, sure of the integrity of your teachers. Why, you took in the sacred, sacred scriptures with your mother's milk. There's nothing like the written word of God for showing you the way to salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Every part of scripture is God-breathed and useful one way or another, showing us truth, exposing our rebellion, correcting our mistakes, training us to live God's way. Through the word, we're put together and shaped up for the tasks that God has given us. How many of you believe that God has a purpose for your children? He has a purpose for you. But as a mother, what do we do? We don't look at ourselves. We look at our kids. Like, what's God going to do? You know, I share this story. Um, some of you that follow me on Facebook, I've been going through this health journey. And I share the story of my son. My son has ADHD. And um, when he was younger, when he decided he wanted to be a pediatrician, my heart broke for him because I knew what a struggle he had academically to get good grades. And I know what it takes to be a doctor. But as a mother, I told him, son, if that's what God put in your heart, that's what you're going to do. And that's what mothers do. But how much more power would be behind your words and behind my words if I had the living, breathing word of God Amen. to back up what I'm saying? Amen. So... Like I said, God knows the importance of a mother and a grandmother. He does. That's why he talks about it here in Timothy. But he shows us other examples of good mothers, great mothers, and not so good mothers. So I'm going to just bring to your memory some of the women that I came across when I was studying this. Rebecca. Rebecca was the mother of Jacob and Esau. Genesis 27, 28. She used her maternal power and she, you truly have power. That's what I want you to understand. She used her maternal power for manipulation. You see, as mothers, we do the wrong things for the, I mean, we do the right things for the wrong reasons, and we, we do the wrong things for the right reasons, and, and we swear that we have to help everyone. Everyone needs our help. I would take in stray dogs if, you know, if God said take in the stray dog. I mean, that's just, that's the heart of a mother. But she truly did something, I think, for the wrong reason. Regardless of that, she lost her boys. They parted. They feuded. They went their own way. And she, she truly did lose them. And it impacted their lives for a really, really long time. And then there's Bathsheba. 2 Samuel 12, or I was just saying 2 Samuel, talks about her situation. We all know her situation with with King David, out of her affair with King David, she lost her baby. 
and I'm sure she felt shame and guilt, and she probably had a really hard time facing God. But guess what? God redeemed her. God gave her Solomon, and she became the queen mother. When David passed away, she was the queen mother. He redeemed her and put her back into her rightful place. So no matter the situation surrounding your pregnancy, God can redeem you. Then there's Joshebed. She was the mother of Moses and Miriam and Aaron. Her determination and ingenuity led to Moses' life and ultimate destiny. She hid her baby, not afraid of what the king was going to do. She put her whole family at risk for that baby. Because the Bible says when she looked upon his face, she saw God's favor on his face. And don't we all see God's favor on our children's faces? And what would you do to make sure that God's will for your child's life came to pass? She put him in a basket, and she left him in God's hands. She let go, and she trusted God. And she got him back. God allowed her a second chance to influence him, to really impart God in his life at a very young age, very, very influential. And then she had to give him up again. But she let go and she trusted God. What do you do when you can't do any more with your children? You let go and you trust God. And then there's Mary the blessed mother of God. She exemplified a very rich tapestry of what a mother is. Excitement, years of work, and moments of intense pain. But through it all, she remained. Through it all, she remained. The love of a mother can be described as fierce, Stubborn, even wrong at times. We're not perfect, and our children need to know that we're not perfect. They need to see us in our imperfection. And my mom's not perfect, but she follows God. I don't need to be perfect, but I'm going to do what I see her doing. I can just see... uh, Timothy's mom, nursing him, praying over him, singing songs to God, instilling words in his mind. I mean, when you're pregnant, when I'm pregnant, I would sing songs to my babies, and I knew they could hear me. Phony faith cannot be passed down. Your faith has to be genuine. So we learned about faith today. It's so important for you to reflect on your faith and what you believe. Because you better believe it if you're going to be telling your kids it. Because they can see right through you. My kids will be the first ones to tell me, Mom, but God. When my faith shakes or when negative words come out of my mouth, they'll be the first ones to to remind me. See, God will use your kids to speak to you. So you be careful of what you're putting into their minds and into their hearts and into their mouths. We hear about these women in these other countries that their kids are mistreating them. How much more does God want your child to be somebody who uplifts you and, and brings you up? But you have to impart those words into their life. Be genuine, be transparent. Genuine faith is infectious. When you meet someone who's on fire for God, you don't want to separate from them. You want to be around them all the time because it's infectious, because it feels good. Because why? Because you see and you hear and you experience the love of God when you're with that person. How many of you want your kids with you all the time? When they're behaved, of course. You want your kids to be with you. But you want them to be with you for the right reasons. And that brings me to um, 
the topic of forgiveness. In 1 Corinthians 12, 25 to 26, it says, the way God designed our bodies is a model for understanding our lives together as a church. Every part dependent on every other part. The parts we mention and the parts we don't. The parts we see and the parts we don't. If one part hurts, every other part involved is hurt. And in the healing, let me say that again, I said it wrong. If one part hurts, every other part is involved in the hurt and in the healing. If one part flourishes, every other part enters into exuberance. Think about when a part of your body hurts, how it affects you. It affects the way you feel, it affects the way you move around, it affects the way you look at people, the way you talk to people. They can see it on your face, it's anguish, it's pain. It hurts, right? And when you experience healing and you get better, how that changes your mood, how that changes your persona, it makes sense. So why does God give us this example? Why does he call us the body? Because when one is hurt, we have to be the ones that come forward and help them out of that hurt. Because you should be feeling the pain with them. And what does that have to do with your kids? As a parent, it can be very hard to forgive your kids. They are our first priority. They need and deserve our forgiveness, true forgiveness and grace. Galatians 6, 1 to 3 says, live creatively, friends. If someone falls into sin, forgivingly restore him, saving your critical comments for yourself. You might be needing forgiveness before the day's out. Stoop down, reach out to those who are oppressed. How are they oppressed? Because people living in sin or people that have sinned, they truly are oppressed. I should say we are oppressed. Share their burdens and so complete Christ's law. If you think you're too good for that, you're badly deceived. We have to learn how to forgive our fallen children, the fallen generation. Maybe you don't have kids. Maybe you're working with youth. Maybe there's a youth that you influence, somebody in your life that looks up to you that you're an example for. Whatever the case may be, now I'm talking about the next generation. We're talking about a generation that's lost, that's hurting, that's looking for an identity. This morning, you learned your identity. This morning, you learned you're a daughter of the king. You have an inheritance far greater than the world's inheritance. You are worth more than this world says you're worth. It is our responsibility now as mothers in the body of Christ to instill that identity into our children. But what happens when you don't forgive a child, when you don't give them the opportunity to ask for forgiveness and to pick things up and put it back together? They don't heal. They remain hurt. And what does a hurt person do? They continue sinning. When our children sin, it is our responsibility to bear the burden with them, to endure to carry that burden with them, to forgive them, and to restore them to their rightful place in God's kingdom. Because ultimately what this is all about is God's kingdom. He said his kingdom will be on earth the way it is in heaven. It starts with us. We have to be kingdom-minded. We're not, you know, they coined that phrase, not of this world. Don't take that lightly. He died for family, yours and mine. So in the midst of a child's greatest failure, pull them back into love. Reestablish them into the identity of the father. They need to know who they are. They need to know whose they are. Once they know who they are, they will start acting like who they are. Let me say that again. If a child knows whose they are, they will act like they know who they are. Pushing 
a hurt child out removes their ability to be reinstated into the family of love and to clean up the mess they've created. Instead of healing, they're hurting. 1 Peter 4.8 says, Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. The enemy wants us to showcase guilt and shame. Love and forgiveness showcases that we put a higher value in the kingdom. Philippians 3.20 says, But there's far more to life for us because we are citizens of high heaven. Do not allow our mothers and grandmothers to step into a place of feeling shamed. Instead, restore them into a place of honor and celebrate legacy. I said, God, should I share my testimony? Only if there's time. So I just whizzed through, now there's time. (laughs) So... Uh, My testimony is that I had a praying mother and a praying grandmother. And regardless of their faith, just say it, they were Catholic, they believed in God's promises. And they prayed for me and my, my siblings. And God took me through a journey. Um, I grew up in a home without a father. But one thing my mom showed me was how to read the Bible and how to have uh, respect and reverence for the things of God. And that's about, I think, all that I took with me as far as my faith. I didn't, as we got older and things got tougher and my, my older siblings fell into the drug life and gang life, um, reading the word just fell out aside. Going to church fell on the wayside. Um, she did everything she could so that I can go through Catholic school Um, She worked her butt off, and, you know, me and my brothers went to Catholic school. Um, But I fell in love with Jesus. I remember being in elementary school and hearing about Jesus, and I remember saying, why did you have to leave us? I just fell in love with him, with the stories of who he was. And I said, Why did you have to go? I want you here. Everything was right when you were here. And now I know that he lives in me and he's alive. And he shows himself to me all the time. Back then I didn't know, but I just knew that I loved him. I knew I loved everything about him. When I was, um, when I started high school, no more Catholic school, I want to be in a public school, and I want to wear what I want and do what I want and say what I want. And uh, I fell into uh, the, the gang culture, and um, I was part of a gang. I sold drugs, used drugs, moved drugs around the state, and went to clubs and partied, and I wasn't even out of high school. And I was looking for that love that I felt for Jesus, and I couldn't find it. But through it all, through it all, my mom prayed. My mom stayed praying, and her faith did not falter, did not wean. Then my grandma moved in, and then there was double trouble. They were both praying for me. (laughs) They instilled in me, uh, uh, I think, a consistent faith. Like, no matter what they saw, no matter what they experienced, no matter what happened in their life, They knew that God was real, and they stuck with that. And that's what I learned from them. As I got older, God got a hold of me, and he rocked my world. And every day, my relationship with him grows, and it grows deeper. And that's one thing that I can say. I don't have a lot of money. I don't have a lot of things. I don't have an, you know, like an earthly inheritance, but my inheritance in heaven, I've given to my kids. I've, I've shown them what it is to follow God. I've showed, shown them what it is to believe in his promises. And I've watched before my very eyes the transformation in them. 
And it's the best gift that I could ever, ever have asked for, is for my kids to come alongside of me and lay hands on me and pray for me. So I hope that you understand how important it is to be real with your kids, to be genuine. Examine yourself. What kind of faith do you have? In and of myself, I may not have studied the Bible like I did, but there was a period in time when every morning I got up at 4 a.m. and I did my devotion, and I knew that my ninth grader was getting up to see if I was out there at that table. And I knew how important it was for me to be consistent and to be real. And now he's thinking about going to seminary. And God is taking care of us, and he's taking care of them. And my, my high schooler, he's a youth leader. And he prays for people, and he prophesies over them, and he lays hands on them, and he's not afraid, and he's bold. And I say, man, I wish I was like that when I was your age. But one thing my friends that, that were in the world would tell me, we knew you were different. We knew there was something about you that was different. We knew that you wouldn't end up where we're at because I knew God, because I shared my faith with them. And even though I went like this because I, didn't, I, I wasn't there yet, they knew that I believed in a real God. So don't, don't think you have to be perfect. Don't showcase shame and guilt because that's what the enemy wants. God can redeem. He can restore. He can rewrite your story starting here and starting now. And if you follow God and you trust God, you let go and give it to God like Joshua did. Because a lot of us, our kids are grown. And all we can do is leave them in God's hands. My mom had to leave me in God's hands. Every time she heard the, the ambulance or the, or the police, she prayed for me because she didn't know if I was there. I would be gone for days because I knew that mom knew God. I knew that I couldn't come home. I knew, I knew that much. I was running from God. I was hiding from God, thinking he couldn't see me thinking he didn't know what was going on if I just kind of ignored him. But I knew that my, my mom knew God. So I would just be gone for days. And then when, when God got a hold of me, I'd come home. But he's such a loving and forgiving God. Amen. He's so good. He never gave up on me. That love that you have for your kids, it's the same love that God has for you. How much greater, though? How much greater he didn't give up on me? Don't give up on your kids. Forgive them. Bring them home. Give them an opportunity to heal. We all make mistakes, but God can restore. The kids of this generation need to know that we are different, that the body is different, that we're going to love without conditions, we're going to love no matter what they do. No matter what their choices are, we're going to love them. Amen. Ephesians 3.20 says, God can do anything you know far more than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams. So even the dreams and the hopes that you have for the next generation God can do so much more. Nothing and no one can keep you from your destiny, keep your children from their destiny, but you. President Teddy D. Roosevelt said, when all is said, it is the mother 
and the mother only who is a better citizen than the soldier who fights for his country. The successful mother, the mother who does her part in rearing and training aright the boys and girls who are to be the men and women of the next generation, is of greater use to the community and occupies if she only would realize it a more honorable as well as more important position than any man in it. The mother is the one supreme asset of the national life. She is more important by far than the successful statesman or businessman or artist or scientist. That's, see, he, he, he saw it. The power of the mother, the power of the grandmother to influence the next generation. And, and, but see, that requires us to, to look at ourselves. If you're going to be transparent before your kids, you have to look at yourself. But remember, it's okay to be imperfect. It's okay to make mistakes. They need to see that. They need to see that you're, you'll always go back to your faith. You'll always go back to the word. And they need to see true forgiveness. Amen? Amen. I don't know um, why. It doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't matter. All that matters is that God wants you to forgive. Be it your children. Be it your parents. God wants you to forgive. So if you would please close your eyes with me and pray. God, we lift you up right now, bringing all of the honor and the glory that you deserve. God, I pray that you would search our hearts. We allow you to take hold of any area of our hearts where we have unforgiveness. God, teach us how to love unconditionally. Teach us how to rear and guide the next generation. Teach us how to increase our faith, how to be transparent before them, to have compassion for them when one is hurting, to lift them up, to lift up that chin and say no to guilt and shame, rather yes to love and forgiveness. God, we're not perfect, and you don't call us to be perfect, but you do call us to fall on our knees and to ask for forgiveness. And so, God, I pray that that same forgiveness that you have given us, that we could show that same grace and compassion towards those children in our lives, around us, in our community, that need your love, that need your compassion, that need your grace. God, today we learn that we have an inheritance, that we have hope, we have a future, that no matter our circumstances, God, you are greater. Help us to instill that in our children in the next generation. Help us to pick them up and not judge them and not condemn them, but show them who they truly are. Help us to help them find their identity in a place of love, in a family of love. Love conquers all, God. I pray that you would show us, show us where we can have more love, where we can increase more love. I call for an increase of love in this church, an increase of love in this neighborhood. Let us put on those blinders, God, and just love, and just love, and just love. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your promises. Thank you for our identity in Christ, in your kingdom. Help us to be kingdom-minded people, God. We truly are not of this world. Remind us of that every day. As my son would say, help us to put on the armor of God. 
and continue fighting for the next generation. I believe there will be a mighty move, a mighty move in this, in this uh, country. It's going to start with our kids. You can either influence them or not. Trust me, someone else will. Someone else will. Thank you, Father, for your move today. Thank you for every woman that's in this place, that you have called to this place, God. You have something good for them, God. I pray, my God, for more, for more, for an increase of your power, an increase of your Holy Spirit, an increase of signs and wonders, an increase of your word. Thank you, Father. If you want prayer, please come to the, fo- to the front and we'll pray for you. If you want more, if you know that there's more to being a Christian, there's more. There is more. Step forward. Step forward and God will meet you where you're at. God will definitely meet you where you're at. Amen.